Okay. Um, hello and welcome to my talk, Next Generation Mobile Rootkits. Um, my name is Thomas Roth. I do uh, embedded security, like hacking payment terminals. I do a bit of distributed computing and mainly breaking and uh, web stuff. Uh, you can find me on the internet, on Twitter, at Stack Smashing. And um, yeah, hope you enjoy it. So let's start with a short introduction into the world of mobile rootkits and uh, ARM Trust Zone. <coughs> so what are we protecting on a modern mobile phone? Uh, we have our communication. It doesn't matter if it's actually calling, if it's writing SMS or WhatsApp for some poor souls, um, or even if it's real life communication, because if I can use your phone as a bug, that's a problem. Uh, we are protecting data, like a lot of people have uh, documents on their phone from their businesses or presentations and so on. We are protecting credentials like VPN keys, your, or, or likely your email password is also the password you're using to log on to your network and so on. Uh, we have payment like uh, NFC payment with Google Wallet, with MasterCard and Visa's papers and possession data because if, if I can rootkit your mobile phone, I can track you. <coughs> um, what kind of mo uh, rootkits uh, have we seen in the wild? There was the famous carrier IQ, which was used for uh, usage statistics officially, um, which interestingly didn't only hide in the CPU, but also in the basement for some windows. Then there is FinFisher uh, or FinFisher Mobile, which is governmental surve surveillance. Um, and there's Cloaker, which is a very interesting research paper about uh, ARM rootkits. <coughs> Where would I hide a rootkit in, uh, on a mobile phone? I have actually two choices. There's the CPU, which on a desktop does everything uh, that has to do with your operating system, everything that you actually see. And then there is the baseband. The baseband is the communication chip. It implements the 3G. It implement, implements the actual calling and so on. And interestingly, on, on most hardware platforms, the baseband and the CPU both have full memory access. So if you can own the baseband, you own the device. <coughs> In this talk, we are going to focus on a small um, hardware, <coughs> hardware edition by ARM called TrustZone. Uh, TrustZone is basically uh, a secure chip in your ARM processor, and um, yeah, it's quite interesting. Who of you has absolutely no idea of ARM processors like coprocessors and so on? Okay, great, thanks. Um, yeah, then a short ARM intro. Um, ARM is a 32-bit RISC architecture, RISC reduced instruction set, so you have a small set of instructions that are simple but can be executed relatively fast. Um, yeah, 32-bit. Um, on x86, your instructions can be uh, can have uh, different lengths. Like you can have, as we've seen earlier in the virtualization talk, 15-byte instruction on ARM. <coughs> all instructions are 32-bit long, except in the so-called sum mode, which is a mode uh, for extra small uh, instructions, normally only generated by a compiler which are only 16-bit long. And there's some too, but that's a whole different story. On ARM, peripherals like IOs, like maybe your, your frame buffer, maybe uh, some, some keys on your mobile phone are mapped into memory. So if you, if you boot up your device and without setting up the uh, memory protection or management unit, <coughs> and you write at some addresses, maybe some LED lights up, or you can check whether a key is pressed, and so on. Also, uh, coprocessors um, play a very important role on, on ARM processors. Um, a very famous one is the CP15 coprocessor, which is available on all modern uh, ARM processors. It's called the system control co coprocessor. You can do things like uh, configure the MMU, configure power saving, uh, set up your caches, set up where the uh, TLB uh, will reside, and so on and so on. <coughs> so what about ARM Trust Zone? ARM Trust Zone basically allows the processor to switch into a secure mode in which it can at 
hopefully will only execute uh, trusted instructions. Um, the great thing about Trust Zone compared to having a smart card or something similar on your mobile phone is that Trust Zone can have access to the screen, to the keyboard, and so on. So you have secure input and secure output, which is normally considered a problem because if you have a, a smart card in your phone and you enter the pin just on the display in your Android app or whatever, in theory, um, malware could grab the, the pin and talk to the smart card uh, themselves. This is not the case with Trust Zone because it runs on the CPU and can do everything itself. Um, it officially protects against malware, trojans, and rootkits, and so-called trusted execution environments, which are basically small operating systems will run in it. And it's available uh, since ARM v6 uh, KZ, which yeah, is basically all modern ARM CPUs. Yeah, we, w we will get to the irony of the rootkit thing later. <coughs> um, officially, the ARM Trust Zone splits the CPU into two worlds. Um, that's the official terminolo terminology. You have the secure world in which only trusted code runs, and you have the normal world in which your Windows phone, your Android, your Blackberry OS, or whatever will run. Um, the communication between both worlds is via shared memory mapping. So you, if you want to, to have Trust Zone do something, you put it into a, a, a memory area, go into Trust Zone, and uh, Trust Zone will work on that memory and give back information via another shared mapping. <coughs> um, another cool thing is that the current CPU state is indicated to all peripherals on the, on the internal buses of the CPU. So you can have uh, like special memory that is only available in Trust Zone. A lot of mobile phones do that with their integrated MMC card. So they have a partition that is only available in Trust Zone. Yeah, um, trusted execution environments, as I said, they are basically small operating systems um, providing services to the normal world, and you write sm small apps for them, like, for instance, your DRM driver, your movie encoder, or whatever, and pay somebody. I try to find out who have to pay or to actually get an SDK or to be allowed to, uh, to write such an app for the uh, trusted execution environment but nobody uh, was able to give me an answer because I'm just a small company and so on. And if you have any idea what would be a good way to approach a vendor, please contact me. <coughs> and you, you uh, use them in uh, your operating system via driver. For instance, on Samsung devices, you have uh, slash dev slash tzic, which is a, a small trust zone driver. And they are often open source. For instance, the official mobile core uh, <coughs> driver is open source, and if you take a look at it, you may find some interesting things. And to give you a real world example, um, in the USA, Netflix is very common, and they also wanted to go on mobile devices. Netflix is movie and TV show streaming, and if you want the low quality videos on your device, you have to get certified by Netflix. For the low quality videos, you just need to show, okay, our device is fast enough, and we can really stream video in real time. But for HD, the big movie labels require end-to-end -end DRM. So Netflix had to come up, come up with something that ensures that no one is able to just uh, screen grab the movie from the device. And what they do is basically they, they uh, download chunks of the video, put it into Trust Zone, and let Trust Zone uh, de decrypt it and display it on the screen. So you can't just record the frame buffer on Android because it's rendered in Trust Zone. <coughs> yeah, what does it protect against? Well, first off, Trust Zone is not only about protecting the user, but it's mostly about uh, protecting against the device owner um, in cases of DRM. Then it tries to protect against malware so that your credit card, your Google wallet, and so on isn't e easily stolen from the device. And in some cases, it protects against freedom because even if you unlock your device and everything, the trust zone code will still be there and you will have no idea what it does. It can do anything, for instance, be a rootkit. <coughs> so how does it work? Uh, the 
The official documentation uh, describes it as a second register set to the CPU core. So it's basically you, you switch into the, the secure world and it feels like you're your own uh, ARM core, but actually you're, you're sharing it with the, with the, normal, uh, with the normal world core. <coughs> the mode switch from the normal world into the secure world can be either done by the so-called secure monitor call or by hardware exceptions. For instance, if, if a button is pressed or the NFC device is activated, the, uh, the hardware can automatically switch into a secure world. There are also special interrupt controllers available for them. <coughs> um, on the internal buses, there's the NS bit, which indicates the current secure state to all peripherals like screen and so on. So it, it looks basically like that. You have your uh, normal world with all the privileged and user modes. You switch into the, uh, into the secure world, um, which is you switch first into a small monitor mode, a, a small code base, we will get into it later, and then into the secure world where you again have privileged modes and user modes. So if you write an app for a trusted execution environment, it can actually run like, a, like an application abstracted from the kernel and doesn't have all the rights that the kernel has. <coughs> so how does it actually work? Um, you only have this one CPU core and you, you, do a, um, you do a call into the monitor mode, which I call SMC mode here, and the SMC mode basically stores all current registers, turns on the NS bit, and then gives back the, the uh, execution to the, to the standard CPU, but this time with the enabled NS bit on the, on the bus, and so it feels like it's actually two cores, but it's only one. Yeah. Um, so the, the SMC mode basically has to detect, okay, <coughs> is the current request coming from the normal world or the secure world? And depending on that, it either stores the, current re the, the registers of the current world, loads registers of the new world, toggles the NS bit, and uh, gives execution back. Um, memory and trust zone, as so you have the normal and the secure world, and you need a way to... to uh, separate the memory areas so that your normal world can't just access the memory of, of the, the secure world. And that's why on Trust Zone enabled platforms you have the uh, Trust Zone MMU, uh, where you can configure that uh, several, certain memory areas are only available to your, to your secure world. Some are shared, for instance, only readable by the normal world or only writable by the normal world, um, or both. And, uh, yeah, then you have your normal world memory and the secure world can access all of that. <coughs> and yeah, I guess you see why it's handy to have that if you're writing a rootkit. <coughs> um, before we can come to the interesting stuff, we have to talk about the boot process because uh, companies like Samsung and so on invest a lot of money into securing the boot process of their devices. Um, when you start up the device, you first have a, um, a very simple bootloader in the chip itself, in the read-only memory, which loads some basic hardware abstraction, and then does integri integrity verification of the second stage bootloader using crypto keys stored somewhere um, not available to the to normal code. <coughs> then the second stage bootloader gets loaded from flash, initializes the trust zone and the trust zone kernel, locks down the device and then starts up the operating system. And it's very important for, for a trust zone system to work that both these, uh, these stages in the boot process are trusted. Um, there are special trusted boot uh, things available for ARM and yeah, if, if you try to really unlock a modern device, you will see that they are quite good at it. <laughs> um, and yeah, but as soon as one of the pieces in this chain is broken, trust zone is broken. And so you could then read out secret keys and so on. By the way, if you go to HTC or similar companies and unlock your bootloader, you are not actually unlocking your bootloader. They are unlocking the operating system loader for you. But all the, the stages we, we saw here where the initialization of the trust zone takes place and so on, where the real bootloader resides, it's still all locked, locked down. Oh. So 
yeah, you're, you will stay out, uh, out of trust zone and your device will run in normal world forever. <coughs> um, let's talk about hardware support. It's basically on all modern CPUs. As it seems, including the, uh, the Apple A processors, um, we're currently working with some Americans on finding out more about that. Um, yeah. So basically, the vendor installs a small operating system somewhere on the CPU where you can't control it, where you can't just stop it. Like not, it's not like a small, I don't know, task item which you, which you can stop from the operating system, but it will stay there and you have no idea what it does. And this small operating system can do everything and third party apps from untrusted vendors, from my side untrusted, uh, are installed in it. Uh, what could possibly go wrong? We all know that they are going to write very secure code, right? <coughs> so, yeah, let's talk about building an actual rootkit in Trust Zone. <coughs> what a super small rootkit that either runs in Trust Zone and in the, now even entirely in the monitor mode, if you let out all the features, it's the first trust zone rootkit and it's implemented entirely in assembler because yeah, compilers are for losers. Um, yeah. Why would you do that? First off, it's fun. It's, it's really interesting. You will learn a lot, of, uh, a lot about ARM processors, uh, a lot about what companies that implement such stuff do wrong and what they do right. Um, also people, weren't talking about trust zone. It felt like everyone knows it's there, but no one actually tries to find out what, what are they doing there and do we really want trust zone on our devices? And can we use trust zone for our own purposes? Like, I don't know, do our GPG mail or whatever there. <coughs> and also, if we are talking about trusted computing, uh, the trusted is not only about the user trusting the hardware, it's also about the vendor not trusting the user. Um, and in, in some cases, it's a bit about stopping blob because uh, I'm, I'm not an, an open source fanatic when it comes to that, but I would like to at least be able to disable it. Right now, it's like you always have this, this blob there with that does whatever, and I don't like that. Yeah, why is Trust Zone such a cool place? As said, the operating system can't find you. Once you are there, the operating system may know that something is interesting, but it has no idea whether it's a DRM implementation, whether it's, I don't know, GPG mail or rootkit. Even bootloader level memory analysis uh, can't find it as long as the, what HTC gives you as the unlocked bootloader executes in the normal world. And often there are even special storage facilities that you can use to lock data and get it away somehow later on. And AMD is building it into their desktop processors. So if we get lucky, we can even rootkit desktop PCs using an ARM rootkit, which would be quite cool. Um, the first problem I had when, when I wanted to, to try this out was, how do I test it? I, I, don't really like only doing something in software because it tends to, to be different to the real world. Like if you try it in QE mode, it will be different. So I tried to get a, a dev board. Uh, the T, uh, Texas Instruments OMAP, they all have trust zone, but they have two versions. There's the uh, HS, I guess it stands for a high security version and the general purpose version. If you buy a Beagle board, everything runs in normal world. The, the trust zone is completely locked down and you have no idea what happens there. And they, they are really good at locking it down. <laughs> so you can't just exploit the boot ROM. It's quite difficult as it seems. I haven't tried it myself yet, but yeah. Then there's software emulation. Um, QAMO supports ARM and there was a very good paper about, uh, about uh, software development for Trust Zone. And they actually built QAMO Trust Zone, which does a good job at, at emulating Trust Zone. And until I think three months ago, that was the only way for me to test and develop the whole thing. Um, till then, um, we, we found a hardware hack for 
certain devices for certain class of devices to execute code in trust zone, but it's a bit ugly because you have to, to soldier around with very, very small resistors and stuff. Um, and also, I, I really wanted to, this, to do this. I wanted to hack into uh, a trusted execution environment. Um, the whole thing isn't released yet. The whole ex um, exploits for trusted execution environments and so on, they will be released later this year. So I will only give a, a small overview. Um, the first step for, for getting to, to work on a real device was I wanted to track into a trusted execution environment because then I could prove that my idea works on real mobile phone and that it's a real problem and so on. And yeah, first step was getting a binary image of a trust execution environment. Unfortunately, they are not open source. Um, there's one open source, but it's, oh, it was actually open source. They just put it down and yeah. Firmware updates for most Android devices are only signed but not encrypted. So you can just download uh, either drive by download by sniffing or uh, <coughs> download it from the vendor's hidden FTP service. You can Google for them in URL FTP and the vendor name is quite successful. And yeah, you can just download them from the, from the net and try to split them apart because they also contain your Android stuff, application stuff and so on. <coughs> the basic workflow for that is uh, to disassemble the bootloader. Unfortunately, when you start to analyze a bootloader or something similar, it's not like a, uh, a standard Windows executable which you load into either and it will automatically see, ah, there's code, there's data, um, because it's, it's not an, an executable file format. It's really just the instructions and the data mixed and you, you have to find out uh, like if the, <coughs> if the processor switches the state from 32-bit uh, to 16-bit sump instructions and back, you have to find this all and uh, yeah, this is what it first looked like when I loaded it in and run some auto analysis. The, uh, is this a yellow, I guess? Uh, this yellow stuff is, I have no idea what, what resides there and the blue stuff are actual instructions. And this is after I was finished with it, uh, this is a big image and this is all uh, the code. <coughs> And yeah, if you, if you uh, boot up a device and it executes some code, it may configure as the MMU and the whole memory mapping stuff. You have to find out at which address uh, is your bootloader actually running, at which address is your trust zone code running. And if you, if you are really unlucky, you will have to analyze a lot of coprocessor instructions by hand uh, till you find out how it works. So then I started looking for uh, runtime mitigations like address space uh, layout randomization and co in the trust execution environments. And uh, I was really wondering whether they are very, very good implemented or just not there. And it uh, turns out no address space layout randomization, no uh, data execution prevention, ARCA and XBIT. Executable heap, stack, data, everything. It's basically exploiting like it's 1999. <coughs> um, just as a suggestion, uh, suggest, uh, yeah, just as a tip. <laughs> um, string copy is not as easy as it seems. Um, if you use a string copy to, to copy a string from one buffer into another and you give a destination size and your, your source buffer is exactly as large as the destination size, string copy won't null terminate. Uh, please use strill copy, which is a BSD uh, a string copy function and also I do code reviews, so if you have problems with such stuff, uh, hey. And uh, yeah, they're still often pretty hard to exploit, but in this case it was very easy because immediately after the, the uh, source buffer came as a buffer where I could put data in and it was really easy to exploit. You'll find more about that later this year. So yeah, um, we now have four ways to, uh, three ways to actually test the, tr uh, the rootkit and 
it's quite awesome now. The first thing you have to think about is how will I get my rootkit to execute regularly? Because if, if I just put it into trust zone, it will be there, it will be in RAM, but how do I get the, the CPU to actually execute it in regular intervals? Because I, I can't just write an Android driver called rootkit schedule that toggles every 100 milliseconds or so. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so also the latency that is induced by the, by the use of the rootkit must be very, very low so that you can't just analyze the, the latency between certain calls and see, oh yeah, it, it now takes like one milliseconds to do, to do certain calls or do software interrupts. There's something happening there. Um, yeah, to, to make them more clear. If you, for instance, you can set up the interrupts to immediately jump into the secure world. So um, this is something I use. I use the standard software interrupts so that uh, as soon as an interrupt occurs, the CPU sh changes into the secure mode. The monitor code gets executed. My rootkit gets <coughs> executed for, for a small time. And then it switches back into the monitor code and back to the normal world. Um, the part I marked in red here will, will be latency. You have to make all this as fast as possible. So if your rootkit is copying a lot of data to the integrated MMC, you may not want to do a one gigabyte transfer at once on a software interrupt. Uh, people will notice. <coughs> but luckily, ARM gives, gives even some tips on how to invisibly run one's uh, <coughs> code in, in trust zone um, because you can, they, they uh, suggest that you obfuscate interrupt timing and try to, to make it a bit fuzzy so that you can't just measure whether the rootkit is, is uh, executing or not. So even if your rootkit has nothing to do, you still want to waste time on, an, on a software interrupt so that it can't be de determined whether the rootkit is doing something or not. Uh, you can use the performance counters to measure the the time. Uh, the virtualization talk today, uh, if you watched the video, had some similar analysis to find out whether you're running on a virtualized environment, and it's basically the same problem. Um, yeah. <coughs> so I, I already talked about uh, using interrupts to transfer the control to the um, to the CQ mode. Um, there are two kinds of interrupts on ARM. There's the FIQ, the fast interrupt, and then there's the normal slow interrupt. Um, the fast interrupt can be put, um, can be locked down so that it can't be masked by the normal world. So if a fast interrupt occurs, uh, it will always land in CQ mode and it will always execute. Normal interrupts can be masked so that they don't interrupt. For instance, if I, if I have a very time sensitive part of code, I will disable all interrupts so they can make sure that the code executes uh, very fast. <coughs> um, then there's the external abort uh, interrupts, like if you, if you do an invalid memory access, um, you can't really use that to go into the CQ world because they, you can't uh, predict when they will happen. You, you don't know whether they will happen a lot or only sometimes and so on. Um, <coughs> you could override the interrupt vector, so if you if you decide that the normal world will handle all interrupts, you can just override the interrupt vector. Uh, the research rootkit Cloaker does that, does that very good. Um, and there are even special trust zone interrupt controllers which could be used. But it's difficult to find documentation about them because every vendor may change something with the interface and so on. <coughs> yeah, to, to give a better picture about uh, IQ interception, um, as soon my, my phone is no, it works. Um, as soon as an, as a software interrupt occurs, the monitor saves the state of the normal world, executes a small slice of the rootkit, restores the state, and the real interrupt handler is called. And as I said, this is what the what the late, uh, what uh, generates the latency, and where you have to be very 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 fast. <coughs> so yeah. Um, after finding out all this uh, scheduling stuff and testing it a lot so to find out whether it really works because there are some differences uh, to, to 
keep it simply, uh, be between the emulation and the real world. And yeah, the basic boot process starts with the setup of the CQ world. This is, you basically fall out of the, uh, the ROM bootloader into your own bootloader. And the first thing you have to do is set up memory. You will have to, uh, to turn on the MMU, tell the MMU, hey, I'm trust zone, give me this area and make sure that the normal world can access it, uh, configure your stack, create a page table. And uh, I would suggest if you're, uh, <coughs> if, you're uh, if there's no trusted execution where I'm normally installed on your device, um, put the rootkit into an address space next to a hardware mapping or, or some other mapping so that someone who tries to implement something uh, will only think, oh, the documentation is wrong, the buffer of the device is actually larger or something similar. <coughs> yeah, um, the initialization. Um, I try to make my, my rootkit as enterprise-y as possible so you can actually install apps in my rootkit. Uh, and as the system boots, you, uh, you will have to initialize the rootkit so that it can set up its memory, set up it, its virtual threads, uh, configure a small system call facility. So I, I implemented a small facility which, with which you can store stuff on the integrated MMC and so on. And it loads modules uh, if modules are configured. Um, the scheduler is a timer-based slice scheduler. I, in, in the, on the actual hardware, I use the ex external interrupt controller to make sure that my rootkit only executes for a very small time until it gets back. Um, um, yeah, and I store files in secure storage if available. Um, this is quite difficult because uh, finding out which part of the MMC or of the peripherals are actually only available in the secure world uh, yeah, you won't find any documentation on that for normal mobile phones. <coughs> the second step is uh, setting up the monitor code, which will store the progression between the normal and the secure world and back. Um, as said, it will store the register banks, turn on the NS bit, execute the rootkit scheduler code, uh, restore the, the old register banks, and turn off the NS bit. Yeah, this is the actual assembler code. It's it's very very easy to write monitor code. You here you just get the current state of this of the NS bit from the coprocessor 15. You test whether it's uh, <coughs> it's zero or not, and depending on true or not, you you will see whether you are coming from normal or from secure world. After that, you will have to store all register banks. Um, this is an instruction on ARM which just stores the, the current registers R0 to R13, oh, the code is faulty, whatever, <coughs> uh, to memory. And then you switch through all CPU modes and do the same for, for all CPU modes so that you won't overwrite anything. And vice versa if you are restoring them. Um, an important thing to keep track of is cache and pipelining stuff because if you if you conf if you uh, do memory accesses in the secure world and they're still in cache and you switch back to normal world, the normal world might be able to retrieve the cache contents. Be sure to have your cache configuration right and use pipeline flushing instructions because if you secure uh, if you turn off the NS bit while being in the secure world maybe some instructions of your secure code will still be in a pipeline and execute. <coughs> yeah, another thing is um, what I did for latency reduction is that for the, for the whole storing register banks and so on, I use tightly coupled memory. Um, that is memory that is very, very fast to access on the CPU uh, and that massively reduced the time I spent in the monitor mode uh, when benchmarking and as more time as I save there, as more time uh, will I have to execute my rootkit. <coughs> the next uh, thing was that there's a CQ configuration register in the coprocessor, which I use to, to set the IRQ to always jump into CQ world. And you can actually tell the coprocessor to make sure that the normal world can't read 
the state of this register. So the normal world won't even know whether the uh, whether interrupts are jumping into the normal or in the secure world, which comes in quite handy, handy for executing invisibly. <coughs> the next step is the lockdown of the trust zone, <coughs> um, which is basically disable the modification of certain bits on the coprocessor, set up the worlds, and disable DNS bits so that you're running in the normal world. This is just a sample configuration. If you play with it, you, you can get the slides online and yeah, it, it will help you a bit, I guess. Oh, and uh, I decided uh, you, you can disable, uh, that the normal world can mask, disable interrupts, but I decided to not do it because uh, yeah, it, it will be suspicious if, if the hardware is not able to disable interrupts. Uh, why would somebody do that? Uh, also, depending on which hardware you're running on, you may need to configure some other peripherals. Um, external storage may require a special configuration to make sure that the normal world can't access certain uh, partitions and so on. And there's a trust zone protection controller, which also does some dirty magic to make sure that you stay invisible. Yeah, and after that, you just start the normal operating system or operating system loader. Um, set the trust zone is configured, the operating system starts entirely unmodified, you don't need to touch anything, not even the operating system loader. Uh, you can actually boot U-boot after the whole configuration thing and nothing to see here for the operating system. Yeah, real world problems. Um, I, uh, I tried to do it on a certain device first and I couldn't get it to work at all. I was sure that I was doing everything right setup-wise, and then I, I started reverse engineering their original trust zone code, and as it turns out, they uh, actually do some complicated power management setup in trust zone. So I had to integrate the vendor blob into this image, and uh, it was terrible. <laughs> yeah. It boots, uh, what do we do now? <coughs> we have an execution environment that is entirely separated from, uh, from the normal OS. Um, we have configured the CPU and all the peripherals to hide all traces of what we are doing, and we get control of the CPU regularly because software interrupts are used a lot by operating systems, and yeah. We can access all user data. It doesn't matter if it's the integrated uh, SD card, if it's something else. We can manipulate the memory of everything. I actually use Trust Zone to root some uh, lockdown Android versions on certain devices so that I can take a look at what the Android is doing, uh, what they are trying to hide. And we can communicate. And that's something I want to talk uh, Yeah, yay. <laughs> but Communication is quite hard because you, as you can imagine, you, you can't just send it out by network because you, you're not running a network stack on Trust Zone. Because if you were, then the normal operating system couldn't use the network anymore. Um, it was quite difficult to find a solution for that. Um, you can either talk to the basement directly, um, like reset it hard and, and tell it to connect to UMTS and just send it out via UMTS, which at least for the normal person is very difficult to sniff. Um, but it's really a, a pain in the ass to implement. Um, there's also this suggest, su ah, suggestion by, by Cloaker. Um, they talk directly to the network hardware, but the problem is, uh, yeah, you will notice if your phone sends out data, uh, if, you're, if you have a good network administrator and so on. It's very suspicious and very easy to detect. So yeah, communication was quite difficult. <coughs> what else can we do? There's quite some secret stuff available. Uh, once you break in into a running trusted execution environment, you will find interesting keys, you will find interesting papers data, and uh, it's interesting, but I won't go into too much details here until everything is resolved. 
um, yeah, how can we install it in the wild? We can use uh, an Android app to exploit the, the, uh, the API. We can have the vendor deliver it like in, uh, with carrier IQ and so on or by a firmware update if like if you're a government organization i would guess that vendors would uh, would sign your custom bootloader with special features for you or you can use a baseband attack and do it from there <coughs> um yeah I, I have to be a bit quick um intro interoperability Ports to new hardware are very easy to do because it's almost the same on all hot hardware platforms. So as soon as, as you get your code into Trust Zone, everything is cool. And yeah, only some peripheral and memory stuff uh, differs and you may missing some, some chips which not have to be configured then. Um, I also started binary patching a trusted execution environment to actually contain my rootkit just for demonstration purposes. Uh, I'm, I'm not using it for work, it's just a fun experiment for me, so if your device gets owned, I'm not at fault. And yeah, there's an open source uh, TE, which is quite interesting to look at, and I integrated my code into it and w am planning to release it open source later this year. <coughs> um, yeah, detection methods. As said, the main detection method would be latency. Or if you're uh, stupid at communicating, um, and the only way to avoid having a phone uh, having a blob in Trust Zone is to use phones that don't have Trust Zone. But good luck with finding any. Yeah. So, thank you. And any questions? The slides are online and yeah. Any questions? No? Good. Then thank you very much. <laughs>